Part 2, June 1774, you gentlemen of England who live at home at ease, how little do you think upon the dangers of the seas? Give ear unto the mariners, and they will plainly show all the cares and the fears when the stormy winds do blow. From You Gentlemen of England, 18th Century Mariner Song. Chapter 6 I hate river crossings, moaned Basil. They stood beside a small dock, watching a single-masted sloop bob its way across the York, the boat's sails full in winds that brushed up occasional whitecaps. A music master drowned on one of these ferries, Nathaniel. He rode from plantation to plantation, staying several days at each. With all the rivers and marshes cutting up this region, he had to use a ferry at least once a week. When he died, I gave up traveling to teach. Too many risks with rivers so unpredictable and with horses. Beastly, temperamental animals, really. Nathaniel could almost feel a smile inside himself. The day had been a quick and full education into Mr. Basil Wilkinson. He was, indeed, no horseman. Basil had so worried the horse with jerking the reins that Nathaniel had walked alongside the poor creature to steady it. Now it rested its head against Nathaniel's shoulder, almost as if trying to hide. Nathaniel had never before met such a talkative person. He felt sure he already knew all his new master's history. A Scotsman, Basil was trained in religion and music, but was unable to find work. Times were bad in Scotland. That, Nathaniel knew, ever since the British had defeated Bonnie Prince Charlie. In the Highland clear clearances that followed, British landlords evicted Scottish farmers and placed sheep on their lands. Many had fled to the cities only to starve or fall into debtor's prison. Basil supported himself by teaching children to read and write, bookkeeping, chimney sweeping, and occasional music lessons. Eventually, Basil boarded a ship for America looking for a better life. He paid for the trip by selling himself into temporary bondage as a schoolmaster. Since leaving the plantation, he'd been a field school instructor, a private tutor, a music teacher riding a circuit, a clerk in one of Williamsburg's many shops. Sometimes he played flute for the visiting opera companies. He adapted himself to people's changeable needs for the gentleman's arts as learning was considered. Williamsburg is a very nice town, Nathaniel, but it's not a city like Philadelphia or Charlestown where music and education are in high demand. Virginia has no major port cities because these cursed rivers are so wide and deep. Merchant ships come straight from England to a planter's private wharf, making little need for the town trade. Basil interrupted himself. Oh, I would hate to drown. How deep do you suppose this is? Nathaniel had already learned that Basil often did not really want an answer to a question. It was more a pause in his monologue. I don't mind working so hard, continued Basil. He that will eat the fruit must climb the tree, after all. Here in Virginia, musicians must be jacks of all trades. Even Peter Pelham, the organist for Bruton Parish, doesn't make enough money to feed his huge brood of children. He also runs the jail. As crew members lowered the sails to slide the sloop safely into dock, Nathaniel heard waves splashing along its board, the wind rattling the riggings. It was a pretty sound. Nathaniel looked forward to the crossing. Two gentlemen with horses and another three on foot got off. The boat dipped wildly as each stepped out onto the dock. That's not sturdy, muttered Basil. Let us go another way. He jiggled the reins. The horse remained glued to Nathaniel. A squat, sunburned man called for the deck. Passage to Capahosic side. Four shilling for you, seven for the chair and horse. I, I think perhaps we'd best ride around, Basil answered. Where are you going? asked the boatman. To Williamsburg. I take you within eight miles of the capital, sir. My ferry saves 18 riding miles. That's four hours time. Still, Basil hesitated. Such a small boat. Nathaniel had seen smaller, more weather-beaten vessels load tobacco and head out to open sea. Basil's timidity would confuse Nathaniel. Basil had been so brave in stopping Owen from beating Nathaniel. How could he be so fearful of water? And why now? They had already dallied two hours waiting for the ferry to show up. 
The boatman jumped lightly off the sloop. This boat is as good as any in the colony, he said. It will carry nine horses to the other side. With your small weight, we'll fare skip along the water. Once over, you will find our public house. My wife made pigeon pies today. Stay the night. The way to Williamsburg is swampy. Best take it in full light when you can see the bogs. Nice carriage chair like that might snap an axle if the wheels sink in the mud. Pigeon pie? The last time Nathaniel had tasted pigeon pie was in England. He longed to beg Basil to take the ferry to the pie, yet he knew he could not ask for more charity. Besides, he chided himself what made him think he'd be allowed to sit at the table. In the end, the thought of harming the chair persuaded Basil. During the twenty-minute crossing, he was silent, hunkered down to withstand the boat's rocking. Nathaniel delighted in the smell of brine in the wind, the taste of salt when water sprayed into his face, even though it made his split lip burn. He tracked the flight of a huge blue-gray heron, its long legs held straight out behind its wide wings, making the bird look like a crossbow. Black waterfowl dove into the waters to emerge yards away with a thrashing fish in their red beaks. The sky still clouded. The water was a dark emerald. No matter how far over the side Nathaniel leaned, he could not see into its depths, but he knew crabs and oysters aplenty were below. When they landed on the opposite shore near a vast swath of salt marshes, Nathaniel was disappointed for the voyage to end. Basil harumphed. There, what folly! Foolish of you to be fearful, Nathaniel. Me, sir? Basil hurriedly changed the subject. Look there, boy! He pointed to a large black and white woodpecker darting among the sycamores. Isn't it beautiful? The Indians use their ivory bills for necklaces. Magnificent beings! Gonquians, the Iroquois, and the Cherokee. We used to see their canoes on the rivers all the time when I first came. A rare few come into Williamsburg still to trade. Mostly they stay to Kentucky and Ohio now, since Parliament denies our settling there. Nathaniel had never seen an Indian. He imagined them to be gigantic and painted with blood. The plantation slaves had told him terrible stories about scalpings and demon doings in the night by the tribes. And recently, a half-French Mingo had led raids against settlements along the Appalachian Mountains saying Virginians had murdered his family. Shawnee were attacking there too, right in the area Nathaniel figured his father to be. Unnerved thinking about Indians, Nathaniel noted how long the shadows were across the marsh path, how eerily the grapevines twisted up the trees in the thinning light. The peepers and bullfrogs were almost deafening in their chant, their song to greet twilight as insistent as birds at sunrise. Night was coming fast, Two hours at a goodly pace to Williamsburg, Basil answered Nathaniel's thoughts. He stretched. Let us rest. I must admit that pigeon pie sounded fine. Shall we have some, Nathaniel? Chapter 7 Basil had consumed his pie before Nathaniel even took his first bite. Nathaniel had crept away from the table holding his precious slice against his chest. At the large fireplace in the one-room tavern, he sat upon the hobnob metal on its edge, warming his back and savoring the anticipation of biting into the flaky crust. He caught the scent of roasted onion and clove as he bit into the sweet, buttery meat inside the crisp pastry. He closed his eyes and rolled the delicious morsel around and around in his mouth. Finally, he swallowed. The pie was as good as his mother's had been. He took twenty wondrous mouthfuls to consume the four-inch slice, remembering. Nathaniel sat back to watch the scene before him. The tavern was loud, filled with smoke from the men's long clay pipes. They all seemed slightly drunk and dangerous. Men bet on dice, argued about cards, knocked over their mugs of ale, and jumped up to yell at one another. Two men holding caged roosters planned a cockfight, calling each other scurrilous names. A pasty-faced man in frilly clothes rose unsteadily. His powdered wig was sliding back off his head. Waving a huge handkerchief, he raised a glass, then shouted, To the glory of his majesty, King George of England, may his reign be long. It was as if he had fired a musket. Abruptly, 
the entire tavern silenced. A few chairs scraped along the floorboards as several well-dressed men rose shakily to their slippered feet and raised their glasses. Indeed, sir, one of them added, and to all his loyal subjects here and in our good mother country, England. Hear, hear, the men smiled at one another in a late night, ale-drenched stupor, a swaying circle of silks and lace and brocade. They didn't seem to notice that most of the inn's revelers stayed seated, either glaring at them or looking down into their cups, studiously ignoring the prompt to praise the king. But an elegant man who'd been quietly reading would have none of the crowd's silence. He rose held up a glass of garnet red wine with a high court English accent, he said, Come, gentlemen, raise your glass. Tis treason not to toast our sovereign. Up shot a man with scars thick across his sun-roasted face. He wore buckskin breeches, a leather shirt, and a raccoon tail sticking out of his rounded hat. Treason to ye, but not to me and me friends, he barked. He held up his own wooden cup and turned a circle, speaking to the crowd. I give you the people of Boston. Here's to their steeping the king's tea where it belongs, in the harbor. May we all have such backbone when it comes to it. Aye, a dozen men stood and downed the remains of their drinks, slamming the empty mugs onto the table. The rest of the inn's patrons seemed to slide down into their chairs even further, refusing to look up. In Boston, men who speak thus are to be arrested and sent back to England for trial on charges of sedition. The elegant man put his hand atop the hilt of a sword that hung at his side. We are in Boston, the rough-clad man pulled a thick hunting knife from his belt. This here is Virginia. The two swaggered toward each other. Seeing the trouble he had caused, the man in frills sat down with a gasp, mopping his brow with his lace handkerchief. One of his friends pointed a huge flintlock pistol. The others cowered behind him. A knot of brawny farmers and woodsmen grabbing up their table knives gathered behind the frontiersmen. Others scattered to the walls to be out of trouble. The caged roosters crowed as if delighted that their scrap was to be postponed by a human one. The tavern keeper looked as if he would cry, Sirs, please, mine's a respectable establishment. Just as the two antagonists reached one another toe to toe, the elegant man, calm and disdainful, the buckskin ruffian, snarling like a hound, a familiar voice cried out, Stop! Hold, sirs! All eyes turned. Basil stood atop a table with a glass in one hand and his pocket fiddle in another. His gray hair floated about his head and his face was flushed. Let us use a toast I have heard the learned Mr. Wythe bespeak. Here's to the king. May his majesty long and glorious reign. Be old fool, get down off the table with ye or I'll be knocking you down meself, growled the frontiersman. Peace, the refined gentleman held up his hand. We must respect age. Continue, old sir, and then we will proceed with our argument. He bowed to his opponent and smiled, bringing on a ripple of relieved laughter. Basil nodded. May his majesty reign in the hearts of his free American subjects, and to our friends in Boston and London, and to a speedy, honorable, and happy reconciliation between Great Britain and America, which will preserve the liberties of all mankind. He took a deep breath. Before the inebriated crowd could think through his long sentence, he sung out, And let us seal the peace between us with a song! Gentlemen, I give you the devil's dream to chase the devil out of us. Basil gulped his wine, put down his glass, and began playing. It was a fast, whirling jig, up and down from high to low. Basil's fingers flew along the fiddle's neck. His bow sawed the strings. He almost looked like a flapping chicken. But there was nothing funny about the effect Basil had on them all. First, there was simply a pause in the growing trouble, then silence. Then one by one, people sat back down. As they began clapping to the merry tune, the frontiersman disappeared out into the night, and the swordsman took up his book again. The sigh the tavern keeper breathed was large enough for Nathaniel to feel across the room. For an hour, Basil played, finding melodies to please and to pull out singing. Some were sad, some about heroes, 
some celebrated poor men's pranks on the mighty. Finally, he came to a song from the comic opera, High Life Below Stairs. The words made fun of the rich and what they were slave to. The tavern crowd needed little prompting to sing along with gusto after the night's earlier clash. Come here, fellow servant, and listen to me. I'll show you how those of superior degree are only dependents no better than we, both high and low in this do agree. See on finder's spark and embroidery dressed, who bows to the great, and if they smile is blessed, who is he, if faith but a servant at best? Chapter 8 The next morning, Basil climbed into the riding chair with a wide smile that lit his thin face with a sunburst of wrinkles. He held up several coins before putting them into his waistcoat pocket. Never underestimate the power of music to soothe or pay the rent, Nathaniel, he chirped. That innkeeper was very grateful for the help of my fiddle last night. He gave me back the cost of our passage and our board and thanks. Ho ho! Basil picked up the reins and slapped the poor horse, causing her to prance nervously along the path. Nathaniel jogged along behind. He admired Basil's self-motivated cleverness. He himself never thought quickly enough to bring on good fortune, and bravery or defiance, as he found out yesterday, only brought on trouble. He could still barely see out of his swollen and bruised eye. He knew he'd carry the embarrassing mark of being beaten for days. Nathaniel did long to ask what the tavern brawl had been about. How did men dare to speak ill of the king? And why would such rich men care a whit about what commoners had to say? And what was sedition? When they entered the edges of Williamsburg, a little past ten o'clock, Nathaniel received his answers. He was already agog at the multi-storied brick buildings at the edge of town. Basil had explained that they were part of the College of William and Mary, a place dozens of scholars came to study together. Philosophy, history, ancient languages... Fancy that, Nathaniel had thought. He hadn't before realized that there was much to learn beyond adding sums or reading words. Then he spotted two long rows of elegant gentlemen. Gravely, silently, they followed a man in purple robes who carried a silver mace. Hundreds of people, some in silk and wigs, some in workmen's frocks and leather aprons, lined the street. No matter their dress, none made a sound. Only a tolling church bell accompanied their march. Instinctively, Nathaniel lowered his voice to a church service whisper. What is this, master? Basil watched a moment before answering in a somber voice. These men are members of the House of Burgesses. Do you know what that is, Nathaniel? Nathaniel shook his head, not taking his eyes off the strange and silent parade. It is like Parliament in England. They are elected by Virginia freeholders to represent our needs. Governor Lord Dunmore represents the king. The House of Burgesses passes laws about roads, the militia, fees the ferries can charge, even taxes. The Burgesses have been meeting since 1619, starting in Jamestown. This procession is in support of the people of Boston. Know you what has happened in Boston? Again, Nathaniel shook his head. All he knew of Boston was what the frontiersmen had shouted the previous night. Little news of the outside world had traveled to the plantation other than word there was new trouble with Britain. Basil took a deep breath before beginning, as if to give a speech. For more than a hundred years, colonial legislators, like Burgesses, governed without Parliament's meddling. The Burgesses have been responsible for levying taxes in ways that were well considered and fair, putting the money to use here, to run Virginia to the benefit of both the colony and Britain. But the French and Indian War cost the king a pretty penny. Parliament decided to pay off England's debts by taxing us. First came the Sugar Act taxes, then the Stamp Act, which imposed a fee on all printed paper, newspapers, legal documents, even playing cards. We have no members of Parliament elected here speaking for us in London. It's taxation without representation. Most unjust completely against the British Constitution. If Parliament forces us to pay taxes without our agreeing to it first, what arbitrary rule might come next? Besides, it was through our sweat and tears that the colonies grew. No member of Parliament I know has braved the ocean, Indian attacks, unknown disease, and a wilderness to build this new world. 
Why should they profit from work they have not done? The latest insult is to force us to pay an import fee on tea and to purchase it solely from the British East India Company. The tax itself is not much, but it's the principle of the matter, Nathaniel, the principle. Boatloads of that unwanted tea sailed into Boston. The people of Boston refused to unload it. Men, calling themselves the Sons of Liberty, dressed up as Mohawk Indians and dumped out every bit of that tea, 90,000 pounds into the harbor. Now England is going to blockade Boston's port until the town agrees to pay for the tea. Nothing, no foods, no goods will be able to come in or out of the city. The people could starve. British troops control the city. Anyone caught promoting protests, engaging in sedition, as is the legal term, will be sent to England for trial. That's a passage to the hangman, if ever there was. When our Virginia Burgesses heard of these coercive acts, they called for this day of fasting and prayer. It is to show that an attack on one of our sister colonies is an attack on all British Americans. These men are on their way to say prayers, that's all. But Governor Dunmore sees our standing by our Boston brethren as a challenge to the king's authority. So Dunmore dissolved the house. He banned their meeting. See that man there? Basil pointed to a dignified, heavy-set gentleman in front of the procession. That is Peyton Randolph, Speaker of the House. Well, I suppose I should say was Speaker. When the governor dissolved the house, Mr. Randolph led the Burgesses straight to the Raleigh Tavern and kept right on meeting. They have called on Virginians to give up tea and to not buy anything shipped here from England. They've suggested a Congress of all the colonies so that representatives from Georgia to New Hampshire can unite, making our voice stronger. Very clever, that move is. The Burgesses may even urge us to stop selling our tobacco to England. The thought is that completely cutting off trade would pressure the king to stop this madness. Breaking off trade altogether could ruin planters and merchants, the people who hire me to teach their children. Basil wrung his hands in worry. Well, such methods worked once before to push Parliament into repealing the Stamp Act. Hopefully they will again. Everyone is trying to keep the disagreement polite so that reconciliation can come quickly. Basil watched a moment longer before adding, Still, I fear this business will tear friends and families apart. Evidently, it was Mr. Randolph's brother, John, who advised the governor that a quiet day of prayer and fasting was a prelude to more dangerous defiance. He is the attorney general to the governor. Some say it was on John's word that the governor dissolved the house. I wonder what those two brothers have to say to each other today. An extremely tall, very serious, and very strong-looking man who dwarfed all the other Burgesses caught Nathaniel's eye. Who is that, master? Who? Nathaniel pointed. Oh, that's only George Washington, a surveyor and planter. Now let me see if I can find Patrick Henry. That's the voice stirring up patriotic zeal. Basil stood up in the writing chair and scanned the crowd. Nathaniel recognized the name as that of the father of the youth who purchased Fixin. He waited with curiosity. Odd. Unlike Henry to not be in the middle of this, Basil muttered, a most controversial man who argues the most radical of points. Why, he's even defended the Baptists. Basil nearly fell out of the carriage with looking. Nathaniel stroked the horse to keep her still. He'd be dressed almost like a parson, Nathaniel. He's a rather plain fellow in appearance, really. No one can argue his effect on people, however, or his bravery. It was Mr. Henry who convinced the Burgesses to resist the stamp back. He insisted we have the same constitutional rights as Englishmen, despite our living in the colonies. He even hinted that the king was becoming a tyrant. Some of the Burgesses shouted that Mr. Henry was speaking treason. He is said to have answered, If this be treason, make the most of it. Make the most of it indeed, Mr. Basil. A lean, dark-haired youth appeared behind the riding carriage. He grinned, grinned merrily. Another of your lessons, Mr. Basil? Do you ever tire of preaching? At least this lecture is worth the having. The youth winked at Nathaniel. He was freckled and dimpled with huge chestnut brown eyes, and there was a good-natured light touch about his teasing. Basil did not seem offended. Bye, Ben, Basil matched his banter. Had your lessons equaled your revolutionary rhetoric, you would be a master craftsman in your own right much sooner. 
and miss the delight of bedeviling you, sir? No, indeed, reading and ciphering are for old men. Basil smiled at Nathaniel. Listen not to this wastrel lad. This is the very apprentice I told you of who introduced me to Eden McGuire. Eden had despaired of teaching him his catechism, and so he hired me. The atrociousness of his spelling is equaled only by his lackluster addition. Ah, oh, Mr. Basil, why would anyone be concerned about spelling and adding when we are in the midst of such times? There are so many more important things to be concerned about. But then we are trying to redefine our relationship with the crown to safeguard the rights of Englishmen around the globe, whether colonists or Londoners, which will be accomplished through rational, legal, learned arguments. Ben rolled his eyes and hit upon a way to stop Basil's lecture. Mr. Basil, for shame, he thinks you've forgotten your manners. He nodded toward Nathaniel. Oh dear, so I have. Ben, this is Nathaniel Dunn. He comes to join our household, hopefully as an apprentice. Junior to you, of course. Huzzah! Ben threw up his arms in celebration. That means you get kindling duty, Nathaniel. He walked around the chair to shake hands. Nathaniel nodded and looked down shyly. I like the looks of that eye, Nathaniel. Ben lowered his head to inspect Nathaniel's black eye. Got you that in defense of our liberty? Not understanding his meaning, Nathaniel remained mute. A silent one then, Ben asked. Not allowed in these times, my friend. Be you Whig or Tory? Nathaniel was still perplexed. Patriot or loyalist? Nathaniel didn't know what the labels Ben was using meant, but he knew he planned to stay out of trouble. He would keep his head down and get by. Choices only brought on abuse from those who didn't agree, especially choices that put one at odds with people in power. Leave off, Ben, Basil said gently. The lad's just arrived. He knows not of politics. But best he learn, Master Tudor. Choices must be made. Those who stick by Parliament will not be popular, but those who try to straddle the fence between both or claim to be neutral will only be suspected and hated by both sides.